Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel and welcome to my new high screen Intel Pentium PC. Now what a beauty this is. I saw this one in a local ad and what stood out was that it came complete with original monitor and original keyboard so I was lucky to have the whole set. And the same day I also found also in a local listing the speakers that go with this system. And these look super cool with the high screen logo here at the front. Now I love an AT based Pentium mini tower system just as much as the next person. But this to me is kind of special. Because you see I've always had a thing for these Vobis high screen computers. I remember as a kid looking through computer magazines trying to figure out what our new PC would be like. We didn't have a PC at the time because I was more of a Commodore 64 Amiga type kid, but our family was planning on getting a new computer. So obviously I had to do my homework. And I remember being fascinated by looking at these Vobis high screen computers in various computer magazines. There was a brick and mortar shop very close to us where they sold these types of computers. And they had like this weekly magazine where they would showcase all of their products. Looking at the specifications like CPU speeds, the amount of memory, DX versus SX, the different hard drive sizes and doing all kinds of comparisons. Now during that time, and I'm talking about like 1994, 95, 96, computers were pretty bland. They pretty much all looked the same in the sense that they were these kind of beige towers or mini towers. But all of a sudden they came up with this sky tower which had a phenomenal design. But what really blew my mind was the high screen Kalani line. Now this was a lineup which was specifically designed by some designer I think and they made these computers look completely out of this world. And I was completely in love with that design. I mean just look at that big tower here with the Kalani design. I mean the cool push buttons, the power switch. I really should put out an active filter for this and see if I can track them down in local listings or on eBay. I have seen one sold on eBay for around 60 euros I think. But you know, some of them are badly beaten up and if I want to have a system I want to have a system that is you know in, in better shape than, than what you're seeing here. So I'm still hoping fingers crossed to find myself a high screen Kalani either desktop or tower system. But for now this one will have to do. At least it is a high screen computer. This one is an Intel Pentium so pretty modern. We have the nice little power button here. We have an 8 speed CD-ROM drive, 3.5 inch disk drive, a turbo button which I don't think should work on a Pentium and a reset button. So yeah other than that pretty standard uh, mini AT style case. We have a power supply, serial parallel. Everything is very nicely labeled. We have the video card here and a sound card. So on the back we also have the Vobis quality control label. So yeah, let's hope this one still stands. Like I said I also found matching speakers for this system which I think is pretty cool picked these up for like eight euros which I think was a good deal it wasn't that far from me because these things are just impossible to find if you're ever looking for like high screen uh, speakers you're never gonna find them and just by sheer luck and accident I just happened to stumble across a local listing that uh, a guy is selling these in original box for like eight euros about ten minutes away from me so yeah I mean what are the odds? And I also have the matching high screen VGA or Super VGA monitor. So this is the LE48P, a 14 inch CRT. And I also have the original keyboard that came with the system. Unfortunately it's not high screen branded in any way. It's just a generic AT style uh, keyboard but yeah. Pretty happy with this set as a whole. So yeah, looking forward to checking this one out. But as with any system, I'm anxious to see what we will find inside. So let's open her up. And what we find here is a 
fairly traditional early Pentium style motherboard. This is an Intel one. You can tell by the yellow stickers there. We seem to be having a video card and a sound card. That's basically it. We have a small cooler here for the Pentium CPU. We have the hard drive, disk drive and CD-ROM drive. So all basic stuff. Now I couldn't help myself and I had to take a peek at the CPU. And as you can see here, this is an Intel Pentium 75 megahertz, the A8502-75. On the bottom of the case, we have this sticker here, which outlines the model number, which is the TMP75 PCI. We have a 150 watt power supply, AT style, of course. And let's see if she will turn on. No explosions just yet. Do hear a couple of sounds and nothing on the screen. So yeah, that's a bit unfortunate, but I did hear a post beep and a lots of other beeps as well. And that's strange. Could it be the brightness and the contrast of the monitor? Yep, that's it. So at least we're getting something on the screen and I'm guessing the beeping is because the CMOS battery has failed. So that's a nice way of high screen letting us know that the CMOS battery needs attention. But let's just go into the BIOS, see if we can set the date and the time and see if we can get the system to boot. Now this type of monitor obviously doesn't have auto configuration. So we need to put the vertical and the horizontal width uh, in manually using these dials. Hard drive seems to be auto configured. So let's see if we save the changes here, if the computer will boot. We have the Ami BIO, 16 megabytes of RAM, floppy drive installed, still we, still we get the CMOS battery error, and we are prompted to insert a bootable media. So for some reason, the hard drive is not found. Now I did notice as I was turning on the PC, I did notice the fan was spinning and the power supply fan was spinning, but there was no sound coming from the hard drive. So yeah, hopefully the hard drive isn't completely dead. I tried disconnecting the power supply and reapplying the power connector again, just to see if it would all of a sudden start, but it didn't. So time to get the hard drive out of the system and see what is wrong with it. So what we have here is a Mac Store hard drive, IDE, 850 megabytes, dated 1995. Now I did try to start the computer one more time with the hard drive in my hand and all of a sudden the hard drive started spinning. So I guess just by removing the hard drive, we kind of yeah, made something unstuck <laughs> inside the hard drive. I don't know how else to put it, but it's definitely spinning now. So let's put it back into the computer, restart the computer and hope that it will detect our hard drive because that's what needs to be done before we can start it. So we're anxiously awaiting the startup messages here. Keyboard detected. Do we also have a hard disk? Yes. So we have found the Mac Store 7850 AV as well as the CD-ROM drive. Still the CMOS battery, need to replace that coin cell ASAP, but let's hit F1 to enter the BIOS. So it has found the hard disk C. Let me just set the date and the time again. So yeah, so this is one of those typical uh, setups that you see on uh, Intel boards, AMI BIOS based. It's pretty simple. So here it has detected the Pentium 75. We can configure the peripherals. Uh, there is no onboard audio, so there's no audio configuration, but we can configure stuff like serial ports, parallel ports. Here we have the advanced chipset configuration. Again, pretty standard stuff. It also has some power management features, so it will shut down the hard drive and the video. plug and play configuration, security, but let's just exit with saving the changes and see if it will now boot from the hard drive. So yeah, fingers crossed. 
And yes, sir, we do see it booting into Windows 95. So that is really, really cool. But unfortunately, our happiness was short lived as soon after the splash screen, we were confronted with this message. Data errors on station C. Abort, retry, fail. Retry doesn't really do much. We can keep on retrying, but at some point you just got to give up. And then luckily we have the Simpsons to keep our spirits high, our motivation uh, high, and see if we can continue with this PC. Now I was able to boot in the MS-DOS prompt. It already started complaining about CD-ROM drivers that were missing, probably because it is unable to read that specific folder. Now I was able to read the folder structure so the hard drive wasn't completely dead, but there was definitely something wrong with it that prevented it in booting into Windows 95. And judging from the sound of the hard drive, it's going to be a very difficult experience in getting this hard drive up and running again. So time to disassemble all the components. We've already looked at the Mac store hard drive, the 850 megabyte IDE hard drive, which is failing us at the moment. Now, of course, this hard drive is over 25 years old as the manufacturing date is dated 1995. So the next card we have in this PC is the ATI video card. So this one dates from 1995 also and uh, copyright ATI technologies. And it is in fact a PCI Mach 64 VT standard VGA output. Obviously I'm guessing this one has one megabytes of Ram. And then the final expansion card that we have here is this oddly shaped sound card from ESS. It's an audio drive ES1868. We have the CD-ROM audio cable. So yeah, game port, microphone line in speaker. Your pretty standard 16-bit ISA sound card also has a CD-ROM connector and a wavetable header. Next up, we have a bunch of cables here for the IDE, hard drives, floppy drives, serial and parallel ports. Now to access the motherboard, we need to unscrew these two screws here at the back. And then we can pull down this little uh, metal frame here where the motherboard is attached. Obviously, we still have some cables here, so we're going to go ahead and remove those. These are the jumper wires that are needed for the reset button, the turbo button and the uh, uh, hard drive LED and here we have it the Intel motherboard for this computer it's a pretty big motherboard and you can immediately tell that this is an Intel board by these uh, yellow or orange stickers here here we have the model number for the motherboard and the motherboard here is an Intel advanced EV Codename Endeavor, which is a Socket 5 Pentium 1 motherboard capable of handling up to uh, 133 MHz Pentium CPUs. We've got four PCI connectors here and three 16-bit ISA connectors. It had optional onboard audio as well as optional onboard video. Now mine has neither and that is uh, clearly visible here as you know you have a lot of you know empty solder pads here on my motherboard and these were basically used for providing the additional uh, chips and connectors for the sound uh, chip and the video chip. The audio was provided by a Creative Labs Vibra 16S with a Yamaha OPL3 chip and the optional onboard video was provided by S3 with a Trio 64V Plus uh, chip. You can't get any more mid-90s than that, I think. Now, the audio jacks for the embedded Vibra 16S were provided by a special custom header here on the motherboard and as well for the S3 Trio 64 uh, video chip there was also this kind of breakout board which gave you the VGA port as the ports weren't obviously embedded on this AT style board. 
Now this one uses the Intel 430 FX chipset, commonly known as the Intel Triton 1, or simply the FX chipset. A very strong, here we have the CPU and the CPU cooler, socket 5, Pentium class CPU. So let's go ahead and remove the CPU from its socket. And here we have it, the Intel Pentium 75 megahertz. We have a connector here for uh, external cache. So this is one of those coast uh, module connectors. Motherboard also has cache on board. We have four uh, Edo RAM uh, sockets. Two of them are populated, so we have 16 megabytes of RAM in total. Here we have a, a set of dip switches that we can use to configure the board. And on the PCB itself, we can see what the various switches mean. So there is a CPU table out there that you can use to reference the CPU speeds and the bus speeds and the bus frequency. There are switches to clear the CMOS to enable disable passwords. Now, as you would expect from a Pentium board, we have lots of integrated components here, like we have two ID connectors for hard drives and CD-ROM drives. We have an onboard floppy drive connector, a game port connector, two serial ports, and also a parallel port. We have a standard AT power supply. There is an additional power connector here. Not really sure what that is about. We don't need to worry about leaking batteries as this Pentium class motherboard obviously has a coin cell. So let's look at the CPU and the CPU cooler and heatsink. Now, a lot of times these Pentium class machines were actively cooled with a CPU cooler on top of a heatsink. You also had a lot of passively cooled systems, especially OEM vendors like Dell opted for a slightly bigger uh, heatsink and that uh, eliminated the use of a fan. Here we can still see the cooling paste on the ceramic uh, CPU. Just gonna go ahead and remove the CPU. I love the look and feel of these, both ceramic CPUs, but also these gold-plated CPUs. I'm just going to get that uh, cooling paste off. I don't think it's really necessary for these types of CPUs. But I just want to see that beautiful Intel Pentium logo here on the ceramic CPU. You also had these gold-plated Intel Pentium 75 CPUs. I think these were the earlier ones. These are also pretty cool, obviously. But yeah, the model that I have here is just the plain ceramic one. Intel Pentium 75 megahertz. But now back to the issues with the hard drive. So I put everything back together. I started the machine again. And of course, we still had the data errors on startup. But with some persistence, I was able to get through the retries and it eventually booted into Windows 95. Now, it took a long time for it to boot and it was unable to find certain DLL files, probably because, you know, file system damage or whatever. So um, this is definitely not an ideal installation, but I was able to boot into the desktop, although it took several minutes to get there. I was also able to browse the hard drive, but again, it took a very long time. Certain folders were uh, unreadable. So it would be very difficult to still use this hard drive in the system. I didn't want to start uh, Netscape Navigator 3.0 as it was a very long time since I've seen this splash screen, but it kept hanging there due to the hard drive issues. So time for a replacement. So the first one that I had at hand here was this Western Digital Caviar 340 megabyte hard drive, which is a bit of a downgrade, but yeah, it was also making some weird noises. The computer automatically recognized the Western Digital hard drive, so that is good. But as I was attempting to format the drive, I did encounter some issues. At first, I mean, the hard drive was making some seriously weird noises, and eventually the format got terminated and I was unable to format the drive. So in the end, I just decided to put this hard drive out of its misery as it was kind of screaming at me, shut me down, shut me down, retire me, which I happily did. And I replaced it with another Western Digital hard drive. This one, an upgrade, a 1.2 gigabyte hard drive, 
which formatted without any issues on this system. So with that done, we can start the Windows 95 installation process by booting from the Windows 95 disk because this system is unable to boot from a CD-ROM drive. So we start the Windows setup and hopefully we will have a working Windows 95 installation in a couple of minutes. Now it's been a very long time since I've installed Windows 95 on a computer. I think the last time was on my AT&T Globalist where I used a GoTech and a floppy based install of Windows 95. Now this one is running very smoothly with the 8-speed Gold Star CD-ROM drive and it was able to install Windows 95 without any issues. Or so I thought, because on the first reboot, all of a sudden I got prompted with this. Please insert the disk labeled Windows 95 CD-ROM drive. Now, the drive is in my CD-ROM drive, but the CD-ROM drive isn't recognized by Windows 95, which is a bit odd because I was able to do the installation from the hard drive. Now apparently this seems to be a common issue with Windows 95 as it forgets that you do have a CD-ROM drive on the subsequent restart after the installation and it forgets to load the CD-ROM uh, drivers. So what I needed to do was to start with my floppy disk again, copy the Windows 95 files on the hard drive and then just load up the remaining Windows 95 files from the hard drive. I also installed the ESS sound card as this is not automatically picked up by Windows 98. But then finally, my Windows 95 based high screen Pentium 75 megahertz system is up and running. I replaced the coin cell battery, so no more daytime issues. The new Western Digital 1.2 gigabyte hard drive is recognized alongside the CD-ROM drive. I am able to boot straight into Windows 95. This is the OSR2 version, so it comes with Microsoft Internet Explorer. And you should hear that Windows 95 startup sound in just a second. Isn't that lovely? Well, I hope you enjoyed part one of this high screen Pentium 75 video. Part two will focus more on the software that you can run on a Pentium 75 megahertz system like this. I've also found a rather matching networking card to go with the system. So that will be very useful to load some additional software on it. So that's a video that will be coming soon. I hope you stick around for that. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up or giving it a thumbs down if you didn't like the video. Also feel free to comment. I always try to check all the comments and try to respond to as many of them as possible. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do so. It will really help out the exposure of the channel and allow me to create more videos. And I hope to see you guys really, really soon for the next one. Thank you very much and bye-bye.